applause. Mm. Uh, so as you are sitting down and I'm weekly, um, I will call us to appreciate our worship team. But also, can we take a moment to appreciate the servant leaders and TC kids watching your kids? Can we appreciate the parking team that you tried to run over on your way in here? Let's give it up for the production team as well. And so, uh, we would love to see many of you become a part of these uh, servant leader teams, not because um, we're just looking for free labor, but it's a part of your discipleship. It's a part of our spiritual formation. Uh, my name is Derwin. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Transformation Church along with my wife, Vicki. Uh, we started way back in 2010 in a little warehouse right down the street, and God has been incredibly um, faithful. We're walking through a sermon series called Storm Proof, Finding Faith in Life's Difficulties, and the desire and the goal is to help us Figure out what is the purpose of life, and the purpose of life is to know Christ and to take upon the mission of Christ, the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, that we've been created to be Jesus Christ lookalikes, and what's so beautiful about our God is he gives us the grace to actually become who we were created to be. He doesn't need our help, but he asks us to participate by faith. That simply means trusting him, and we're going to be walking through the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher to ever preach, which is the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And right now we're going through what's called the Lord's Prayer. And so we're going to be looking at the section of the Lord's Prayer called, Give Us This Day Our Daily Bread. And so hence, as you listen to the songs, they were to create an arrow with the sermon to give us a linear clear message right to our hearts and our minds that we can trust God because trust is incredibly difficult. And so today we're going to learn how do we de depend on God the Father. And so I was thinking about illustrations and, and what is, I think, the greatest portrait of dependence in creation? It's this. It is a baby in her mother's womb. I mean, it is utterly incredible if we think about it. God takes a man and a woman and he gives them uniquenesses that are different and they come together and life is created. That's not being intolerant. Um, not only is it theological, but it's scientific. And my science and theology does not care about my feelings or whether something's true. I can feel that gravity don't exist, but if I jump off of a building, gravity is going to go, no, I exist. And so the reality is, is there are men and women, and together they create life or none of us would actually be here. But the main premise is this. What the mother gives to the baby comes through the umbilical cord, and everything mama gives to baby produces life. So teenagers, next time you want to argue with your parents and not clean up your room in a house you didn't pay for in clothes, you didn't buy in food in your stomach, you didn't buy, and you want to get a lot of attitude, just remember, your mama sacrificially lets you live in and on her for nine months. And don't forget about dad, because it couldn't have happened without dad. He participated in the process as well. <clears throat> Thank you. I know it's like, there's only been one virgin birth, people. That's Mama Mary. But think about this, right? Think, 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 think about this. The baby is in totally in utter dependence. Well, God the Father, longs for us to depend on him for everything. This is called worship. Worship is a life of dependence. And what you depend on, you actually begin to reflect. Case in point, if you've seen my son and my daughter, they look like their mom and their dad. Well, God the Father wants us to depend on him through Jesus by the Holy Spirit's power so we can look like him. Quickly, 
When it says that God is our father, it doesn't mean that he's a man with male genitalia. That is an anthropomorphical term. What that means, it is human language to describe an intimate relationship, intimacy, into me, you, see. Uh, God the Father is also described as having wings to cover his children. He's not a infinite chicken in heaven. That's just anthropomorphical language. So when it says God is a father or I loved you like a mother, it's speaking in language to define intimacy. Like God actually wants us to know him and to be known by him. This is called worship. And so the Lord's Prayer, which we've been walking through, is a living portrait of the life we were created to live. But I'm going to take it today from what's called the message paraphrase. It's by a gentleman by the name of Eugene Peterson. Because I understand the original languages, I can teach from that. I don't recommend it as your only study Bible, but it's a good Bible to be able to get a different perspective. And so I like the way Eugene Peterson unfolds the Lord's Prayer. And uh, check out the stuff he says here. He says this, the world is, so, is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. I was like, okay, Eugene, just throw out the gauntlet, my man. <laughs> now, this is the part I want you to get. They're full of formulas, programs, and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. And I was like, he nailed that because that's what we do. Like I shared a few weeks ago, a lot of our prayer is actually manipulation to get what we want from God instead of actually getting God himself and knowing him. Don't fall for that nonsense. Now watch this. This is your father you're dealing with, and he knows better than you what you need. So if God the Father knows better than us, what we need, why is so much of our prayers about needs? Because we're not actually praying. What we're doing is superstition and, and, and manipulation from God trying to, to get what we want for our lives instead of saying, God, my life is your life because your son gave his life for me and I trust you. How many of you parents, for the most part, know better than your children? I know some of you children are like, man, my dad don't know nothing. <laughs> you know, like we, like we just didn't come out of our wombs like, I'm 52. No, we ex actually experienced life. The great thing about our father, he's never learned. He's never not known. There are no surprises. He's infinitely loving. He's infinitely good. And he has your best interests in mind and my best interests in mind. And we can actually trust him. Pause. Right now, some of us are going, Father, and all the trauma comes up. First of all, let me pause here, and I'm going to address that. But can we, for a moment, in the church and in our culture, stop beating up men and stop blaming men for everything? As the only men sin. No, no, seriously. It, it, it's, it's like the only problem is with men, masculine, test, uh, 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 toxic, masculine, uh, all this. Like women don't sin? So like, cause, because if, if, if we're Christians, every human being is born in sin. And one of the things that shocked me and amazed me in the church is how women would talk to men like they were little boys. And I'm going, no wonder he doesn't want to be married with you. He wants a wife, not a mom. He's already got one. So can we stop blaming men for everything? And then secondly, secondly, Sin affects all of us. Now, here's the main point that I want us to get. We live in a culture that wants you to be a victim and blame everybody else for everything that's happened to you. That ends in the name of Jesus. When Jesus died for you, when he died for me, when he rose from the dead, I refuse to go, my dad was this, so I'm that. No, no, no. I got a new daddy. He is all powerful. His son rose from the dead. I refuse to be what happened to me when Christ has done for me what I could never do for myself. It is time to get rid of the victim card and be victorious. I refuse to blame and give somebody else responsibility for my life when Christ holds me. Would you like to save a couple thousand dollars in therapy? 
I just helped you right there. I could talk about my dad living six blocks down the road and his addiction and the shame and embarrassment, but what's that going to do other than make me miserable? Or I can think about the one who rose from the dead. I can think about the one who is sovereign. I can think about the one who is gracious. I can think about the one who is kind. I can think about the one who's never lost one of the 99. I can think about him or that. In other words, in the words of the philosophers, the black sheep, you can get with this or you can get with that. You can, ah, uh, y'all know nothing about that. See, y'all young people think we don't know. We invented the hip hop you're listening to. Don't get me, don't get me started up in here. With a God like this loving, you can pray very simply like this. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best as above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiven others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. First, our Father knows and cares about all our needs. He does. He does. He does. So let me address this question and then we're going to address some more one by one. First of all, if you're a little bit like me, you're going, okay, well, if that's true, then why are there Christians around the world starving, and why are there people starving? That's a great question. And perhaps you're going, God, where are you? And I just suspect God is going, where are you? The world does not suffer from a lack of resources. It suffers from a world of greed and political corruption. There is more than enough for everybody. There is more than enough. And I think God often says, well, if you're so concerned uh, about everything in the world, what are you doing to make a difference about it? Secondly, um, I was the kid who at school had a blue lunch card, which meant I was on welfare. My Mom and family was, and I got lunch for free. They probably don't do that today because they're afraid that kids are too um, soft to be able to handle criticism. And I'm like, here's my blue card, and I'm eating for free. You can laugh at me with my full stomach all you want to. Even though I grew up on welfare, and quote unquote poor by American standards, I never missed a meal. Even though I shopped at a store called Hand Me Downs, which was my big cousin handing me down his clothes, I still had clothes, I still had shoes, it may not have been the best, I still had a roof over my head. For many of us, you have those things, but you're not satisfied because you look to the left, you look to the right, and you don't appreciate the blessing clearly in sight. Let me put it to you like this. The reason why you think you don't have enough is because you're too busy comparing yourself to other people. How do you know they're even satisfied with what, what they have? Appreciate what you have. And so what happens is, is we're so busy saying, I don't have this, I don't have that, and rich people this, and da, 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 that we can't even appreciate what God has actually provided. So he does meet our needs. Do we appreciate his provision? Our Father knows and cares about our needs Let's look at the text again. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with, and he knows better than you what you need. And we can trust him to provide our needs physically, spiritually, financially, 
Because our Father promises to meet our needs, not our greeds. Now, let's pause here. There are going to be some of you who are five-talent people, meaning you're going to be business executives. You're going to make a lot of money. Some of you may be five-talent people, and you have a blue-collar job. It's not my job to know what God has put into you. That's between you and the Lord. But here's the thing, though. If I compare my insides with your outsides, I'm always going to be in a position of lack and hurting and disappointment because my focus should be upward, inward, outward. My focus shouldn't be on you. The question is, what do we do with the talent God has given to us? He promises to meet our needs. How do we know? Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Now, the context of this is very important. Paul is writing to churches at Philippi. Philippi was a Greco-Roman colony, lots of soldiers, lots of people from everywhere. It's a very multi-ethnic context. And he's writing to people who have a passion for Jesus and his kingdom. He's discipling them, and they're struggling, man. They're going through persecution. Now, keep in mind, te teenagers, in the ancient world, if you live to be 38 or 40, you old. You old school. People died of common colds. Uh, people died of things that don't kill us t today. So please don't buy the lie that the world is getting worse. Do you know how violent the ancient world was? Like we have some form of sibilance in today's world. The world is actually people live longer, people live healthier, people are more educated. Some of you read. You know how rare that was to be able to read? So what I'm saying is, Christians, stop being scared of everything. That's not attractive to unbelievers nor Jesus. Oh, God, the pandemic, Jesus coming. <laughs> like, we should, we should be the ones going, hey, lost folks, don't, don't worry. Let me tell you about a God who provides. Let me tell you about Jaira. Don't let people scare you to death, man. That's what politicians do. Why are we scared? Didn't Jesus raise from the dead? Last I checked, Nero couldn't stop him. Domitian couldn't stop him. The Middle Ages couldn't stop him. And long after America's gone, he's still going to be ruling and reigning. Some of you are like, well, pastor, I read. I... Nope. <laughs> Family, here's how we can trust that our God is generous. Here's how. You can be sure that God will take care of everything you need. His generosity exceeding even yours and the glory that pours from Jesus. That Jesus himself is the ultimate picture that God is generous. That on the cross that should have been mine and yours, every one of us, male, female, boy, girl, regardless of ethnicity, we are born with this terminal illness called sin. Sin is not just a behavior. It is a dark power that even when we do good things outside of Christ, it's for our glory and not his. The worst form of sin is saying, I don't need God. There are probably prostitutes closer. There are probably corrupt CEOs closer. There's probably people in prison closer to Jesus than some people in churches who think they don't need Jesus. That's the worst form of sin is I don't need you. And one day you approach God and go, look at my resume. And he goes, well, let me show you my son's resume. The only resume I can present to God is Jesus's. That is the only good in me, the only good of any follower of Christ. So on that cross, God's generosity flows out because on the cross, Jesus receives our condemnation. Jesus receives our rejection. Jesus receives the holiness of God, the wrath of God, so you and I can receive the grace of God, the mercy of God, the acceptance of God, that there's a total exchange on the cross. Sinner, and he presents us as saints. Not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done. And in his resurrection, he says, not only do I forgive you, but I'm going to come and dwell in you so you can know and experience my father. So <clears throat> I didn't realize that this was what I was doing in the early 2000s. This is just my story. I'm not saying it's yours. I found a book called Search for Significance by a Christian sociologist. And as a football player, if you study the playbook, you play good in the game. 
So I just started reading everything. I, I didn't know I had a capacity to read until I got saved. I didn't like, like reading books until I got saved. And I didn't realize that the Lord was, was doing a deep work in me that God makes me righteous, God forgives me, but he's my father. So I would have these games in my mind that I would see myself playing in middle school or high school, and I'm like, my earthly dad wasn't there, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was there. That when I was in college, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was there. That when I was in the NFL, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was there. I couldn't see it then, but I appreciate it now because our God is a God who will redeem the past. Our God doesn't live in the future or the past. He lives in the now. So my past and my future and my now is now to him. So he took what was broken in the past and made me feel healed in the present. Man, I don't know if y'all picked that up right there. Like, you can do that work with yourself, too. The Holy Spirit is called the counselor, but you got to slow down. Don't run from the one who wants to heal you. This ain't a part of the sermon, but it is now. Some of y'all stay busy because you don't want to deal with yourself. Some of y'all stay active because you don't want God to minister to you because you think it's too painful. It's too painful to keep going in the direction you're going. So bring, bring that to him and let him transform you. He's generous and he is good. Now watch this. Our father invites us to share in his circle of generosity. Let me teach you a word here. You've heard it before. Every human being experiences what's called God's common grace. If God removed his common grace, the world and universe would utterly implode. You think it's crazy now? So in Matthew chapter 5, Verses 40, 45 and 46, Jesus says that the Father gives, you know, sun and rain to the just and the unjust. So as unbelievers, the whole world, God's going to give you a measure of common grace. But when you enter into his special grace through faith in Jesus, we enter into a supernatural generosity that simply does not make sense, but it makes sense in God's kingdom. And so watch what happens here. Here's the context. The Apostle Paul was a Jewish man, and God called the Apostle Paul to do something utterly radical but biblical. He said, Apostle Paul, I made a covenant with a man named Abraham to give him a worldwide, universal, colorful family, and I want you to do that. Well, the Jewish Christian said, no, this new church of Jesus should just be all Jews and Gentiles have to become like Jews. And then the Gentiles are like, well, we don't really like Jews because they look down upon us. And Paul was like, bump what both of y'all saying. I'm going to follow what God is saying. And so Paul planted churches that look like this, very colorful because the gospel not only forgives sins, but it creates a family with different colored skins. In this context... The church in Jerusalem decided to stay primarily Jewish. And guess what happened to it? It started shrinking. It started struggling. And so these multi-ethnic churches said, you know what? We want to show them that we have love for God and for them, so we're going to raise financial support to give to the church. I want you to see what Paul does to motivate people's hearts to be generous in giving towards the kingdom of God. He says, remember this, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. Pause. Here at Transformation Church, we don't teach the doctrine of tithing, which is 10%. Some of y'all like, praise God, brother. <laughs> oh, I knew I was going to like this church. <laughs> We actually teach a theology of generosity where 10% is the floor. That's like the training wheels of where you start. And so the more you understand God's grace, the more you want to leverage your life to not look for ways to give less, but ways to give more because God has blessed you with his son, Jesus. Early in my faith, people would come to me and go, so pastor, should we give... Uh, should we give on the gross or the net? And I go, well, how much blood of Jesus did he give to you? Did he negotiate with that? Like, why are you looking for ways to give less when he gave all? 
Mm, I felt that. (laughs) He says, I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in giving. Lovingly, and hear my pastoral heart here, some of you are living like this. I get it, y'all. Man, when you grow up poor, now I'm not boasting, but hear what I'm about to say. I have shoes from the 1990s. I have a toothbrush and soap and I clean them all the time because as a kid, I didn't know when I was going to get my next pair of shoes. And so my mentality was you hold on to everything. But here's the problem. When you hold on like this, what you're holding on to is anxiety. You're holding, am I ever going to have enough? Is God going to provide it? I got to get this. And I, Guys, I get it. College is expensive. I get it. I got one going to law school and I got one getting a master's. I, 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 I get it. Uh, I have a family in Texas that I financially support. My wife and I, I get it. We got bills. Owning a home is expensive. I get it. But doing like this is not going to give me less stress. It's going to give me more. And so God isn't going to break your fingers. What he's going to do is go, listen to me, listen to me. Release and let it go. Release that anxiety and get peace. Release and receive. It's hard to receive when you're like this. And don't think in terms of, well, if I give, I'm going to get more money. You're going to get more purpose. You're going to get more love. You're going to get more freedom. Some of us are driving ourselves literally insane, idolatrizing over money. The biggest rival God to Jesus is not Islam. It's not politics. It is money. Money is a wonderful gift in the hands of someone who uses it for God's glory, but it is a terrible master. It is unrelenting in what it calls you to do. God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything more than just ready to do what needs to be done. As one psalmist puts it, he throws caution to the winds, giving to the needy and reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out, never wear out. This is, this is what, what Eugene Peterson is talking about, is God's hiss at his, his faithfulness to the covenant. God will do it, family. You got to listen, listen to this. Check, 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 check this out. So in Lancaster County, there are public schools that are reaching out to us, and they, they said, hey, we heard you guys do these backpack meals for schools. Will you help us? We're in, we're in need. So our financial generosity to the market, for those of you that are new, we produce and give away, well, we don't produce, but we give away 10,000 pounds of food to like 400 people per month, and we've made hundreds of thousands of backpack meals for needy students in public schools. And the public schools are asking us, for those of you who've been around Transformation Church from the beginning, when we were in Little Bitty Warehouse, this is what I said. I said, listen, if our church does not make a difference in our community, we should not be here. The last thing our culture needs is another place where people are singing songs and talking about how great Jesus is. And when the doors close, nothing changes. We believe in a God who provides generously and your giving is making an impact in public public schools. Another thing. So um, Vicky and I are going to Berlin, Germany on Sunday. I've been invited to preach to European church planters and pastors on how to build gospel-centered multi-ethnic churches. So what started in Indian land is heading all the way over to Europe. So there's going to be pastors from all over Europe. Also, your financial generosity is sponsoring many of those pastors to come for free. Keep in mind, in Europe, if you've got a church of like 40 people, you're crushing it. I mean, it's like, wow, we're killing it. So they don't have the financial resources that we have. So you're blessing brothers and sisters all the way in 
Europe. And we're giving them my book, How to Heal Our Racial Divide, as a gift because what's happening in Europe is immigrants from all over the world are coming to Europe, and guess what they're doing? They're saving the European church. You know why? Because those Christians from all parts of Africa love Jesus, from all parts of Asia love Jesus, from all parts of Latin America love Jesus, and the European pastors are like, help us to, to, to bring them in so the church in Europe won't die. When you give, family, that's what you're giving to. It is so much bigger than we can comprehend. You know what? Since I'm here, back in 2019, I was driving down the street in my neighborhood. Um, Teenage young lady we watched grow up in a few houses down the road, was walking down the street. She was crying. I stopped. Are you okay? There were some family things going on. I don't know the specific details. She's like, I'm running away. I'm out of here. Whatever. Um, I'm going to a friend's house. And so I, I prayed for her, did the best that I could. The other day, I'm driving through the neighborhood, and I see her with her mom. And she, like, jumps out in the street, Pastor Derwin. I roll down the window. I'm like, hey, how you doing? She goes, I love Transformation Church. She goes, I feel God's presence here. And her mom goes, I'm so happy she's found a church where she loves Jesus. That's what generosity does, family. Oh, and since I'm here, let me keep going. So last week again, Vicki and I went to see a member of our church who's in a nursing home. She has ALS. She can't move, but she can still talk. So we went in to pray with her, to be with her, to encourage her. We left there encouraged. She said, Pastor Derwin, you keep telling us not what we want to hear, but tell us what we need to hear. And also, she goes, I'm trying to reach as many people in this nursing home for Jesus because I want many of them to come with me. (laughs) Guys, how could I not want to be financially generous when God is doing such wonderful things, and you and I play a part of it, and that's only stories we know about. There's other stories we won't know about. Check this out. Let's continue. The most generous God gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals and more extra- is more than extravagant with you. He ge- Watch this now. He gives you something so you can then give away which grows into fully formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. So one of the things that we introduced and talked about is this. Having a budget, guys, is holy. It is spiritual. Your first 10% it goes to the Lord. Lord, thank you. Now, let's pause here. I, I, I get it, y'all. I haven't been a Christian my whole life. Like, I'm, I'm still somewhat new to this. I've only been a Christian since 1997. So, so I haven't grown, grown up in it. When I first came to Christ, I'm like, hold on a minute. Man, I worked hard in the NFL. And God was like, uh, and where do you get that DNA from? Uh, where you, where you get the coaches who developed you and helped you? Where'd you get the teammates who walked alongside of you? Where'd you get that incredible woman that motivated you when you didn't believe in yourself, but she believed in you and inspired you and pushed you? What happened when you were still in college and she was working four and five jobs so y'all could be in your little 400 square apartment? Oh, so this is yours? where did you get this air to breathe? Where did you get your mind to think? Where did you get any? Everything is a pure gift. You own nothing. That's for you too. And it is so freeing to go, oh, I don't own anything. I'm just a manager for what you own. We start here. Also, listen, 401K retirement, IRA, for those of you that are young. Oh, and by the way, if you got your little Bojangles job, Chick-fil-A, and you're in high school, you need to learn to give too now. Don't wait till you're older. This is for you as well. But also take care of your future. Hear my heart in this, okay? Millennials, I ain't never seen so many broke people go on vacations. (laughs) It is amazing. It is utterly astonishing. Ain't got a house but did eight vacations. (laughs) There's this thing called delayed gratification. Y'all, funny story. I didn't know what a vacation was until I married Vicky. And I was like, your parents are doing what? 
going on vacation. I'm like, what's that? I'm not saying enjoy yourself, but make sure you're taking care of your future. Then, you know, 80%. Now, let me pause here. This is really important. For those among us who may have mental health issues, you may absolutely blow your budget up when you get into a state of mania, and you may not even know you bought stuff. You may not even know why you feel like, I have to have an Amazon package every single day. When a person experiences mania, there's like, you're just not yourself. So what I'm saying is this is a safe space to get help for your mental health. Mania will also cause you to do all types of unhealthy behavioral things. So sometimes it's not an issue of discipline. Oftentimes it's an issue of mental illness. And so this is a safe place for you to get help. We have people who are skilled, and we have relationships with people who are skilled as well. All right. Ultimately, family, our Father meets our greatest need. This is why we can trust him. Our Father meets our greatest need. Here's Jesus. Jesus is talking to Jewish people. And he's reminding them of the greatest event in the history of Israel is called the Exodus, where God freed the children of Israel because the blood was placed over the door, and it was called Passover. The angel of death passed over the children of Israel, and they were liberated and set free. And so Jesus is coming to say, listen, the blood is no longer on a door. The blood is on a cross, and the blood is on you, and I am setting you free, not from Pharaoh, but from sin, death, and evil. And so Jesus says this, I am the bread of life. This, these are the Greek words, ego and me, where we get the word I am. So what he's saying is, I am Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who will provide. I've come to be amongst you. I am the bread of life. The person who aligns with me hungers no more and thirsts no more ever. This is talking about meeting our spiritual need for forgiveness and redemption. He says, I have told you this explicitly because even though you've seen me in action, you don't really believe me. Every person a father gives me eventually comes running to, to me. Listen, it's time for some of us to come running to the father. It's time. One of the dangerous things of living in the South is people go, well, I'm a Christian. I grew up in the South. Well, if I'm in a garage, that don't make me a Honda pilot. You got to know him, and he wants you to know him. It's time for you to come running to him. And once that person is with me, I hold on and don't let go. I'm getting kind of tired. However, if I could, would you indulge me for about 42 seconds? We have a God that in the midst of dysfunction, he won't let you go. In the midst of great betrayal, he won't let you go. In the midst of chaos and confusion, he's a God that won't let go. With a broken heart, he won't let you go. In success, he won't let you go. In every single facet of life, his nail-pierced hands will refuse to let you go. They are unbreakable. They are undeniable. They are remarkable. They are life-giving. They are sin-forgiving. They are death-defeating. He's a God who won't let go. That might not have helped you, but it sure helped me. That's who Jesus is. Your mama may let you go. The husband who said I did may let you go. The wife who said I did may let, let you go. The kids may disown you, but he will never disown you. For the more intellectual among us, here's the doctrine of the incarnation. I came down from heaven. The eternal son of God puts on human flesh. Not to follow my own whim, but to accomplish the will of the one who sent me. Check this out. Two prayers. One, I want to pray for those who are ready to enter into the cycle of generosity. You've been giving God Lent at the end of the month, and he's like, I want your heart. And where your heart is, your treasure will be there also. Number two, I want to pray for those of you who go, holy Toledo, I'm not a Christian. I only know about Christ, but I don't really know him. 
I'm kind of a good person, I think. But, but I want what he was, I, I really want to know the Father too, to depend on the Father. And some of you are going, uh, Mr. Preacher, man, I don't know nothing, but I want Jesus. I'm ready to follow him. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. And after we pray, for those of you online, there's a digital QR code that I want you to get your smartphone and indicate you've prayed to enter the cycle of generosity or you've prayed to receive Christ. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing here as well because there's a QR code on the seat in front of you. Uh, when we go paperless, we actually save more money. But we want to know who prayed so we can walk alongside of you. Who knows how Jesus is going to use your life? Boy, if somebody would have told me a stutterer who didn't like reading books would be a pastor, I'd be like, man, what you smoking? <laughs> Let's pray, family. Lord, I pray for those of us who follow you. We've gotten off track. Instead of living lives of generosity, we live lives of scarcity with clenched fists. Today, we open our hands and say, the way you were generous with me, I choose to be generous with you, Lord. I don't want to be held captive to money. I only want to be held captive to Christ. I trust you to meet my needs. I trust you today. And right now, I want to pray for those of you online and those of you physically here saying, Preacher, today I make a commitment to follow Jesus. I believe that on that bloody, rugged cross, it should have been me. He experienced God's wrath and condemnation so that I could experience God's forgiveness and grace. Today, I receive Jesus as my God and King, and I believe that on the third day, he rose again to live in me and make me a part of his community. I say yes to King Jesus you're beautiful and lovely, and I say yes to you. Amen, amen, and amen. Now, in this moment, um, as people are making decisions to follow Christ, if you have a physical issue and you have to get up and leave, we respect that. But if you just want to beat the crowds, um, please wait, because there are people making eternal decisions. So if you have a physical connection card, and you pray with me one of those two prayers, please fill that out. If you don't have a physical connection card, on the seat in front of you is that QR code. Get your smartphone, point it at it. Check, I pray to receive Christ, or check, I'm entering into the circle of generosity. I'm putting God first. Online, would you do the same thing as well? If you're watching by TV, that QR code is going to come up as well. Let us know. We want to serve you because we believe that you matter in God's kingdom. We'll take a couple more moments to do that. Okay. So family, here is our soul tattoo. Depend on the Father to meet your every need. That is a daily spiritual discipline of trusting. I'm on the journey with you as well. And then here's our action step. Enter God's circle of generosity, 10, 10, 80. And we don't do it as a formula. We do it out of saying, Lord, you come first and we trust you. And as we continue to grow in faith and grow in grace, the 10 goes up. Want to make sure you're saving for your future. It matters. The living expenses go down. God's going to shock some of y'all in ways you never, ever thought was possible. And I cannot wait to read your testimonies of grace. Now, before uh, Winnie and Christo come out, I've got some exciting news to share. So uh, let me show you a picture of this right here. Okay. So <clears throat> in 2023, all these blue dots represent people that are engaged in Transformation Church. There's like 10,000 or so. Praise God for that. That is utterly astonishing and amazing. And so if everybody showed up at once, we'd have 15 services. So we have been in the process of praying 
for multi-site campuses. So our vision, we believe that God has given us that in 10 years, we're gonna have this campus as the broadcast campus and we're gonna have five, uh, four more campuses. Like we believe that God is going to do that for all of these people. We got people over, I don't even know where that's at. I mean, people, Kings Mountain, York. I mean, I don't know who that is. It's Gilligan's Island. I mean, look at all of these people. And I want you to dream with me for a moment. What if their campus is lined up all around and people are being transformed and lives being transformed and what's happening in the seats goes into the streets. And, and check, check, check this out. Check this out. Write this down. I believe that by God's grace, through our faith, time, talent, and treasure, we're gonna do all these campuses and we're gonna be debt free. I believe that that's gonna take place. I believe God is gonna do that through us. And it is, it is utterly crazy, but I want to be a part of a church that where God can only get credit for what happens. I wanna be a part of a church where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit peek over the edge of eternity and go, wow. My children still believe I part Red Seas. My children still believe I raised the dead. My children believe. I would rather believe greatly and found wanting than to believe smallly. So I believe real soon we'll have an announcement coming. Ah, don't try to twist my arm. I believe real soon we're going to have an announcement coming where our first campus is going to be. So to prepare for this, just like we did last year, we're going to have a year in giving, and you can start now, where we give above and beyond what we normally give. My wife and I are praying about it, just like last year. We long and look forward to, 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 to it. And so we're not going to do a capital campaign, because here, we're always looking for new ground. We're always looking for new territory. We're always looking at it. And some of you go, well, why, Pastor? Simple. For God so loved a few people. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, and we want to do our part to join Jesus. We believe that he is worth it. So let's begin to pray and see what this looks like for us. Uh, pray for Vicky and I as we head over to Germany. Danke schön. And uh, yeah, I'm done. Love y'all. See you in the lobby. Pastor Paul here, and I want to thank you for joining us online today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus or you have questions about the service, we want to encourage you to scan the QR code on the device or screen in front of you, and we'll make sure to connect with you regarding your decision or question. Also, if you're ever in the Indian land, South Carolina or Charlotte area, we want to invite you to come join us in the house on Sundays. Finally, we wanna close this service like we do all of our services and that's with our benediction. Our benediction is a good word and our good word is our vision. And together we say upward, inward, outward, transformers roll out. The reason we do that is upward, we love God completely. Inward, we love ourselves correctly. And outward, we love others compassionately. And I've invited some friends to join me today to come close our service. And the reason we do that is because this is just the oh. And now it's time to go play the Yay. All right, on the count of three, stand wherever you are today and join us in our benediction. One, two, three. Oh. Upward, oh. inward, oh. outward, oh. transformers, oh. roll out. Have a great day.